It's Friday the 26th of June 2020 and you're all very welcome back to the Irish Unity podcast where tonight we reflect upon, remember and commemorate the life of Miriam Daly, the Irish revolutionary anti-imperialist, the Republican socialist, prison and civil rights activist, authentic historian and academic of the non-revisionist school and chairperson of the IRSP who was murdered by the British state 40 years ago today 26th of June, 1980. Like many notable figures in the pantheon of Ireland's revolutionary dead, Miriam Daly was born into circumstances that, had she wished, may well have offered opportunities for a comfortable, prosperous and relatively undisturbed life had she only chosen to ignore the historical wrongs which had been inflicted upon Ireland and accepted the lot of the Irish working class as being good enough. Born within five years of the end of the Irish Civil War, within the Curragh Army Camp no less, the daughter of Colonel Daniel McConnell, an IRA Tan War veteran and now officer in the recently victorious Irish Free State Army, Miriam was educated at a time when the families of those men deemed to have taken the right side enjoyed considerably more opportunities for social mobility within the state than those of men who had opposed the treaty in arms, as had the father of Jim Daly, whom Miriam would go on to marry. We can only surmise that it was from some past family knowledge of the Civil War era that a young Miriam McConnell made her first dalliance into politics joining a student branch of Young Fine Gael whilst working towards a bachelor's degree in economics and history from University College Dublin in the early 1960s. Had she remained within that demographic, no doubt life, given her clear and emerging academic and organisational abilities, would have taken a much smoother and perhaps profitable trajectory, as it had with so many other Irish academics, professors, commentators and lecturers who chose to played the game, so to speak, to make their peace with the establishment and who tailored their academic outlook and subsequent curriculum to suit and impress the prevailing powers of the state, giving anything they could for a quiet, often privileged life in the process. Yet another as yet untapped, more fundamentally principled, more radical and rounded worldview was emerging within Miriam Daly one which questioned the wisdom and righteousness of the socio-economic setup within post-partition Ireland, a worldview which would evolve in time into a fiercely principled standpoint that without apology would go on to despise, expose and oppose the school of academia which taught history according to what the teacher believed to be prudent as opposed to what they knew to be the truth. Perhaps it was the further underlying psychological influence of her grandfather, himself a former internee from the Tan War period, a labour-minded railway worker within one of the most militant organised Irish workforces of the period, or perhaps it was just the immense revolutionary fervour that characterised and accompanied the mass student-led protests against the Vietnam War, a movement which Miriam found herself very much part of, having travelled to the University of Southampton in 1964 to take up a lecturing post in economic history, now armed, as she was, with a Master's in Philosophy, specialising in the topic of Irish labour in 19th century England. Whatever the right way of it, by 1968, the year in which she returned to Ireland with her now husband Jim Daly from South Armagh, himself an academic, a university lecturer and an unapologetic Marxist, Miriam Daly's political and academic outlook had taken on a form that was braver, tougher and immensely more principled than the vast, vast majority of her colleagues in the educational settings in which both her and Jim now found work at Queen's University Belfast, a one-time iconic establishment representative of unionist hegemony in the occupied north of Ireland, but now the hub and the launching site of the civil rights movement that was determined to change the character and, if possible, destroy the nature of that hedge money forever. Miriam and Jim Daly, despite securing undoubtedly valuable teaching posts at the prestigious university, 
Jim teaching scholastic philosophy, and Miriam within the School of Social and Economic History, both threw themselves into the ongoing and hectic civil rights struggle of the period, a period in which the stubborn and clearly discriminatory nature of the Orange State was challenged openly and brazenly via a series of unapologetically provocative marches, rallies and street protests, initiatives often led and coordinated by the students of Queen's University and inspired in no small way by similar civil rights initiatives in the southern regions of the United States. True to their well-acquired and informed fields of knowledge, however, both Jim and Miriam Daly knew well that the contentious issues of discrimination which led to and fueled the civil rights struggle were merely symptoms of the wider problem, a manifestation of British imperialism in Ireland and driven ultimately, as it was, by the exploitative system of world capitalism itself. Whatever the short-term successes or other ways of the Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association, the Dailies were well aware that nothing short of the complete emancipation of Ireland, both politically and economically, would suffice should all of its people across the 32 counties live free from injustice and not simply the injustices which had led the students onto the streets of Belfast and elsewhere in 1968. Unapologetically embracing the principled position of anti-imperialist Republican Socialism, by 1974 both Miriam and Jim Daly found themselves as left-wing activists within the ranks of Sinn Féin. This was a period of rapid political flux however, where the sands of political organisation shifted quickly below the feats of activists, and it would appear that via both a political disagreement around provisional Sinn Féin's then contentious policy of federalism and the emergence of a positive working relationship which the Dailies had struck up with one-time IRA border campaign veteran and founder member of the Irish Republican Socialist Party Seamus Costlow led both into the ranks of Ireland's most principled national liberation and socialist-centred organisation since James Connolly's Irish Socialist Republican Party. Jim and Miriam Daly joined the IRSP in August 1977 at the invitation of Seamus Coslow himself and while accounts from the time suggest that the couple, like so many other activists of the time, were impressed by Seamus' now legendary capacity for activism, having first joined with him in the campaign in defence of Marie and Noel Murray, a couple who had been sentenced to hang at the Special Criminal Court in 1976 following the shooting of a Garda officer during a bank robbery carried out by a fringe left-wing political group, it was apparent to everybody who knew them that the Irish Republican Socialist Party was the natural political home for Jim and Miriam Daly. Oscar Brethnach, himself a founder member of the IRSP who was tortured and beaten by the Garda Shikana's infamous heavy squad in Dublin's Bridewell Barracks in 1976, an episode designed to smash the fledgling party in the 26 counties, recalled of Miriam Daly her commitment was to a truly national Republican Socialist movement that united the national and class question. This being so, Miriam's worldview tallied completely with that of Seamus Coslow and the RASP was indeed her political home. As one can imagine, life within the RASP in the late 1970s was far, far from easy. For an activist of any rank, not least one of the clearly emerging organisational and linguistic talents of Miriam Daly. Her husband Jim fondly remembers her very real capacity for harnessing and utilising her knowledge and words and articulating her political principles in a way that could and did stir crowds into action. What she said was genuine and from the heart, said Jim. She could get a terrific emotional response because whatever she said, she felt it herself. She was direct and honest and people responded to that. And of course, in the Ireland of the late 1970s, such talents all too often came with a risk. A risk which Miriam, armed with her immense insight into the ruthless capacity and cruel effectiveness of the British Empire, would have been all too aware of, yet she carried on. The IRSP, after all, were not just another intellectually driven, red banner carrying group in the broad spectrum of what was largely a passive and non-threatening Irish left-wing scene. They were much more dangerous than that. Intellectually based, most definitely. Passive and non-threatening, most definitely not. 
the Irish Republican Socialist Party of Seamus Coslow and Miriam Daly, despite the clear and present risks to their lives and livelihoods, persistently and without apology expressed and indeed made available their support for the ongoing armed struggle for national liberation in the six occupied counties of Ireland. Both elements within militant loyalist paramilitaries and within the higher ranks of the British Tory party itself had long since identified as a greater, more fundamental, long-term threat to the British presence in Ireland what they considered to be the Marxist, intellectually based, class struggle-minded elements of Irish republicanism. This fear is a matter of historical record and was expressed publicly by both UDA leader Andy Terry and not least up-and-coming Tory party hardliner, militarist and would-be Viceroy for the North of Ireland, Uri Neve. And perhaps more than any other figure within the Irish Republican Socialist movement, Miriam Daly was becoming the personification of the growing fears of both loyalist paramilitaries and the Tory elite in this regard. Due to her obvious intellect, her organisational capacity and indeed her passion, based as it was on her deeply held Republican Socialist and anti-imperialist principles. Miriam's proven capacity for organisation may well have saved the Irish Republican Socialist movement and the IRSP from total collapse and at a pivotal time in both Irish history and in the history of the Republican Socialist movement, following the tragic murder and incalculable loss of her friend and comrade Seamus Coslow in October 1977. Seamus' murder was designed to incapacitate the IRSP and the wider Republican Socialist movement at all levels. Argued by many to have been the greatest revolutionary, political and military organiser and activist of his generation, Seamus' loss to the movement would create an organisational and logistical vacuum that to any other fledgling movement may well have proved immediately fatal. Yet Miriam Daly, willingly and with fervour, stepped in to fill that vacuum and by all accounts did so admirably, taking her position in a caretaker executive which was established in the wake of Seamus' death, tasked with preventing the total collapse of the Republican Socialist movement, and to establish stability and plot a way forward, whatever the odds. By all accounts, Miriam's input into the caretaker executive provided a vital stabilising influence to the party and the movement not only during an extremely fragile moment for its own existence, but facing into what would be the most epic prison struggle between Irish Republicanism and the British government in the history of Ireland. This element of calm allowed for the convening of the RSP Ardesh of 1978, an event which the movement's enemies had hoped would never occur and at which Miriam Daly herself became national chairperson of the Irish Republican Socialist Party. Under her watch, the party of Seamus Costello and James Connolly entered into a period of unexpected but real rejuvenation. Vital street-based activities were initiated, such as political protests and rallies held around issues such as police brutality and rights for Republican prisoners in what was a dangerously deteriorating situation in the hate blocks. The party newspaper The Starry Plough was given a new emphasis. It was relaunched and distributed across Ireland, which had a knock-on impact of reactivating common areas that had been quiet since the loss of Seamus. Miriam's own proficiency in the use of foreign languages, in particular French, allowed her to speak on behalf of the party to the international press, creating a much-needed international standing. And in general, it felt like the public profile of the IRSP was re-emerging and recovering. Not insignificantly, This party renewal and regeneration coincided with an upsurge in the armed actions of the Irish National Liberation Army in the occupied six counties, which, in its entirety, provided the Republican Socialist movement as a whole with a level of organisational integrity which was to stand it well in the upcoming hate block showdown between Republican prisoners and Margaret Thatcher, during which the Republican Socialist movement would play an integral and significant part and for which it would be recognised eternally. No authentic history of Miriam Daly, however, would be complete, were it not acknowledged that she also suffered greatly from the frustrations and personal disappointments experienced by all revolutionary leaders in a time of war, 
fallouts occurred, frustrations were expressed and positions were resigned. Given Miriam's personal dislike for the revision of history, it would be remiss of us not to mention how she suffered personally during the course of her life and for her commitment to the well-being of the Irish Republican Socialist Movement. And despite the hectic, busy, hazardous and often heartbreaking journey on which she had embarked as an Irish revolutionary leader at a time of guerrilla war, Miriam remained both a committed mother to her twins, Donal and Marie, and astonishingly did not even give up her role as a committed academic and lecturer. Indeed, her capacity for all-round intellectual, political and revolutionary activity was reminiscent of recorded accounts of the commitment of Seamus Coslow, who himself, it seemed, never stopped. Miriam's likewise capacity in this regard was later recalled by husband Jim, who stated, Miriam never tired of giving. In the immediate few years before her death, as well as playing the part of the leader of Ireland's most radical revolutionary party, she was also a driving force behind several Irish history societies. She became editor of the Searer Irish Historical Journal. She contributed to the Thomas Davis Lectures and RTE and was also active around philosophical studies and journals committed to Irish history, the Newman Review, business history, Irish economic and social history and Ulster folklife. At the time of her death, she was also working on a textbook around Irish economic history and was still lecturing at Queen's University, Belfast. Indeed, prior to joining the IRSP, Miriam was an advocate of extramural learning, the concept that suggests that university-level education should be expanded and made available to those well beyond the walls of universities and be brought into the wider community. In this capacity, Miriam Daly had organised the first ever Symposium on Irish Labour History, which opened up the doors of Queen's University to non-subscribing students. Interestingly enough, during the Ulster Workers' Council strike of May 1974, during an event that attracted no small number of Protestants and trade unionists who, despite their non-Republican backgrounds, would have heard Miriam's non-redacted, non-revised, unapologetic analysis on Irish history. Miriam Daly had no time for revisionism. She was loath to tailor or tamper with what were evidential historical truths simply because they may not have been fashionable to repeat or may not have garnered favour with the university hierarchy or indeed the state itself. Again, Jim Daly elegantly reiterated how as an historical lecturer and commentator she refused to engage in the process of academic conflict resolution when discussing the history of Ireland believing that such a process of revisionism was no less than an imperialist confidence trick. He was to give an example of Miriam's steadfast refusal to engage in revisionism during the unveiling of a memorial mural to her in West Belfast in 2016. Long ago, Miriam read an official authoritative government volume on the Irish curriculum. It said the purpose of history was to understand the other person's point of view. No, said Miriam. It is to find out what happened and who did what to who. This no punches pulled approach to commentary and historical analysis would raise eyebrows and cause a bit of a stir at a significant event in Liberty Hall in March 1978 during a large gathering which had convened to debate the legacy of James Connolly and which met under the title of the Dublin History Workshop. The event was addressed by Mick O'Reardon, Communist Party leader and veteran of the Spanish Civil War, Nora Connolly O'Brien, daughter of James Connolly, Miriam on behalf of the RSP, and various other speakers and elected representatives of the broad Irish left, who to one extent or another claim to represent the legacy of James Connolly and his revolutionary message. Miriam's contribution to the event was, it seems, frowned upon by some for being too weighted and partisan in favour of the IRSP and the INLA's claim to the legacy of James Connolly. However, known or not to those assembled, Miriam had just returned from delivering the oration at the graveside of INLA volunteer Tommy Trainer, a 29-year-old founder member of the Republican Socialist Movement who had been murdered by the UVF in Portadown earlier in the week. He had been the third member of the Trainer family, alongside his mother Dorothy and his 17-year-old brother Ronnie, to be murdered by Loyalists, due directly to their support for the Irish Republican Socialist Party. 
Miriam was acutely aware of and affected by the scale of the sacrifice she had just witnessed in Portadown. And for her, later that day in Liberty Hall, the word revolution was not some abstract notion or recollection which had occurred on the battlefields of Spain 40 years earlier, or which was reserved for the martyrs of the GPO 20 years before that. It was something which for her was occurring in the here and now, one hour up the road in the streets and fields of County Armagh, and the IRSP were the most deserving of the legacy of Connolly in those circumstances. The real price of being so outspoken, of being so precise in the identification of and the articulation of historical and contemporary truths would surely be the coming to attention of the many nefarious and dangerous forces of the British state which sought to meddle in and maintain its dark links to Irish affairs in the face of armed opposition to their presence. On 30th of March 1979, British far-right militarist and would-be Tory Secretary of State for the occupied six counties known as Northern Ireland, Erie Neve was assassinated inside the grounds of the British Houses of Parliament in London in an action claimed by the Irish National Liberation Army. Subsequent British Prime Minister and protégé of Erie Neves, Margaret Thatcher, was, it is reported, deeply affected at a personal level at the death of a man who, it seems, was keen to exercise an overtly militarist response to events in Ireland, including the reintroduction of internment and the utilisation of the SAS. Thatcher, who would go on to demonstrate during her tenure a penchant for identifying, seeking out and killing individual Republicans deemed responsible for armed actions of note, would no doubt have been frustrated in the extreme at the failure of the Cream of Scotland Yard and Britain's detective fraternity to come up with any evidence or leads capable of securing even a charge, never mind a conviction, in relation to the most audacious armed action of Irish national liberation at the heart of the British Empire itself. It is a matter of historical record that six months before the INLA's assassination of Erie Neve, in the September 1978 edition of the Story Plough newspaper, Miriam Daly was quoted as specifically condemning the attitudes of Erie Neve himself, comparing the apparent heroic status conferred upon him due to his escape from Colditz prisoner of war camp in World War II to the attitude shown by the Tory party to escaped Republican prisoners during the contemporary current period. In the same edition, it is said that the INLA volunteer Ronnie Bunting was photographed, albeit with his identity hidden, in an article which had announced the apparent attention of the INLA to go on the offensive. One can only speculate today as to whether or not the publication and the attributing of a direct quote about Erie Neve to Miriam Daly in the Story Plough newspaper had any bearing upon subsequent events. However, it is highly unlikely that it went unnoticed in the darker corners of the corridors of Whitehall. With the continued upsurge in the armed campaigns of both the IRA and the INLA, and the increasingly chaotic nature of revolutionary political organisation, Miriam Daly had taken a step back from party politics by the time that she had been elected to a leadership position within the emerging National anti hate Block and Armagh Committees, a radical street-based group committed to raising awareness of and securing the rights of protesting blanket men and women who were engaged in a no-wash or dirty protest for political status in the run-up to the epic and tragic hunger strike period of 1980 and 1981. The prisoner issue was always one close to Miriam Daly's heart, and it is unlikely that this was due merely to her clear and obvious support for volunteers acting in the name of Irish freedom and national liberation, but due to her deeper understanding of the myriad of social and economic factors which see young men and women from all walks of working class life behind bars. Indeed, she was known to have taken a previous interest in the welfare and educational well-being of loyalist prisoners in Longcash in the earlier years of the 1970s. On the afternoon of June 26th, 1980, Miriam Daly crossed the road from her home in the Andersonstown area of West Belfast to go to a local bakery. It was a frequent enough journey for Miriam in that she liked to treat her twins with apple tarts, cakes, buns and the like when they returned home from school nearby. They were 10 years old. The Dailies had moved to Andersonstown due to its nationalist demographic and perceived subsequent safety 
in comparison to their previous home which was situated close to Queen's University and the nearby Holy Lands area which was then still a relatively strong area for Loyalist paramilitaries. Between leaving her home and returning from the local bakery, gunmen took logistical advantage of her being out. They waited for her return and subsequently executed Marion Daly. Tragically and heartbreakingly, the aftermath was discovered by her beloved twins, Donal and Marie, an immeasurable trauma, no doubt. RSP historical officer and former INLA prisoner Gerard Murray recalls the feeling at the time, and like many more, he is in no doubt that Margaret Thatcher, acting either directly via the use of British Special Forces or via well-trained proxies within the UDA, pursued and procured the state execution of Miriam Daly, if not as a direct result of the INLA assassination of Erie Neve, then as a means to deliver a hammer blow to what the Tory establishment saw as the intellectual edge of militant Irish republicanism, personified as that edge was by the Irish Republican Socialist Movement and the upcoming National Armagh Hates Committees. You know, so, Miriam, if I was in front of Miriam, I'd have been doing the same. I'd have been going to the safety of Anderson's hand and or somewhere like that. And I remember asking anyone. that Thatcher particularly feared the RSP due to their an academic insight that was maybe lacking in, in other quarters. Would that, would that be right? Well, that'll, that'll be partly true. That'll be a factor. But she also had a hit that over the early thing. Right. Early when she was you know, was the head of the Irish Gerard Murray, having asked Ronnie Bunton his opinion on the matter, was left in no doubt of Bunting's own belief that the state were directly involved in the killing of Miriam Daly. The subsequent professional manner in which Bunting himself was executed, alongside his comrade, friend and another Republican socialist activist, Noel Little, in the heart of a heavily populated nationalist area under the nose of 24-hour British state observation and against all usual characteristics of what had been random loyalist sectarian assassinations also surely adds weight to the belief that the British state directly or indirectly carried out state murder on both occasions. Later, Miriam Daly was claimed by the INLA as a Liberation Army volunteer and she has been acknowledged as such ever since. In the early 1990s, Donald Daly, in the now long established Belfast tradition of improvised political wall mural painting commissioned and completed a mural which reflected the deep academic, revolutionary, anti-revisionist opinions of his mum, depicting amongst other things emblems of truth and lies, the watchtowers and occupation helicopters which characterised the militarised area of South Armagh, an area which would have been held in great esteem by the Daly clan, given the occurrence of childhood visits there and indeed Jim's own links with the area. On top of this mural, he simply placed the title History is written by the winner, Miriam Daly. The mural remained there for decades, becoming part of the backdrop of the Belfast mural and conflict tours 
and appearing in many books, articles and websites in the process. In 2015, however, this mural was replaced unceremoniously and without courtesy with a pop-art mural of little or no significance, bearing the arguably counter-revolutionary slogan, You Can't Change the World, a quote or lyric of some sort by Joey Ramone. The new pop-art mural was, it seems, commissioned to be part of a rock video on behalf of multi-million pound earning rock band U2, whose lead singer's antipathy and hatred for Irish republicanism and everything Miriam Daly stood for is well documented. Whatever about the tired and dusty state of Donald Daly's previous mural in memory of Miriam, its unceremonial removal to be replaced with a painting that meant absolutely nothing caused an uproar within the local community, and not least within the Republican Socialist base. The RSYM, Youth Wing of the IRSP, launched a fundraising drive and in 2016 commissioned, secured and erected a permanent mural in memory of Miriam Daly, situated at Oakman Street just off the Falls Road in West Belfast. The mural itself was unveiled by Donald Daly, while Miriam's husband Jim gave a grand historical account of her legacy both in a revolutionary and academic sense. The silence within circles of academia, not least within Queen's University, around the murder of a colleague, has not passed without comment, and the general failure of that institution to remember the legacy of Miriam Daly is no less than astounding in the common age. However, what cannot be doubted today, on the 40th anniversary of her death, is the eternal debt of gratitude that the current Irish Republican Socialist Party owes and acknowledges to its former chairperson, comrade and academic custodian, Miriam Daly. The Irish Unity Podcast, on behalf of the IRSP, reiterates the intention and objective of that party to someday ensure that in Miriam Daly's name, history will indeed be written by the winner in a 32-county sovereign Irish Socialist Republic. Gramila Mahig, Ehoi. Margaret Thatcher on TV Shocked by the deaths that took place in Beijing It seems strange that she should be offended The same orders are given by her These are dangerous days To say what you feel is to lay your own grave Remember what I told you If you were all the world, they would love you England's not the Mythical and of Adam, George, and Moses is the home of police who kill black boys on mobiles. And I love my boy, that's why I'm leaving. I don't want him to be aware that there's any such thing as me.